thank you. That was really moving. I am. Um, I'm really relieved about a few things. One is that they've given me. I don't know if you can see this kind of mic. Is it? I, is it better if I clip it higher up? The reason I'm relieved is because when I gave my TED talk, they made me wear a head mic. You know those things where they strap it to your head and you. And I said to the technician as he put it on my head, you know, if you make me wear this, I'm going to feel like Madonna. And and he looked at me very intensely and he said you should always feel like Madonna. So, so now, now whenever I wear one of those things, whatever I'm saying, I get this urge to just randomly sing Papa Don't Preach, which uh, would, would be particularly inappropriate at this gathering. Uh, so I, um, I'm also relieved that, um, they agree, that, that Pastor Ed was lovely enough to say that I didn't need to have a PowerPoint. I think we should legalize drugs and criminalize PowerPoint. I think, <laughs> so I'm afraid you're just going to have to, Look at me. Uh, I'm also relieved that they haven't, recently when I've been giving speeches, they've um, often on this screen equivalent of this, they put my publicity photo, but it's my photo from two and a half years ago before COVID. And since then I've gained so much weight that I started to feel like a Weight Watchers ad where I'm like <laughs> the before, the after and there's the before. Um, so I'm really relieved. Um, I'm really grateful that you're, you're all here. I'm particularly grateful that you're here. because I think you are an essential part of this debate. So as you heard in the intro, this is a very personal subject for me. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to, and I was too small then to understand why, but as I got older, I realized we had an addiction in my family and several members of my family. And when I started working on my book about this, Chasing the Scream, exactly to, almost exactly to the week, 10 years ago, um, I was a real mixture of feelings, right? Part of me could see that my relatives and the people I loved were really suffering, that they needed help, that they were in a bad way, that they needed compassion. Another part of me, although I was never, sorry, it's rustling slightly, so I'm gonna put it there instead. That's better, isn't it? Um, but I also, I was never in favor of the drug war, but I had really angry voices in my head. I would look at them and say, well, what's wrong with you? Why doesn't someone just stop you? And I think partly out of that, that, that tremendous conflict, I thought, well, I'm not gonna find the answer in myself and my interactions with the people I love with addictions are not going so well. So I'm gonna go on a journey to try to make sense of this. So I ended up going on a really big journey all over the world. I traveled over 30,000 miles and I, I wanted to sit with people who'd been affected by really different elements of the drug war, of the alternatives to the drug war. So I got to know a crazy mixture of people from a, a trans crack dealer in Brooklyn, who's one of the wisest people I know, to a hitman for the deadliest Mexican drug cartel. Um, he, he's definitely not one of the wisest people I know. Uh, to the only place that up, that up to that point that had decriminalized all drugs, I'll get to that. And I learned a huge amount, but it was really challenging to realize that so many of the things I had seen, I, I had profoundly misunderstood. I realized drugs are not what we think they are. Addiction is not what we think it is. The war on drugs is not what we think it is. And the alternatives to the war on drugs are not what we think they are. So I want to talk to you about some different aspects of that. But I want to start where I start the book with a story. And I think a lot of people, when they first see it, think, why has he started with this story? What's this got to do with the drug war? When you understand this story, you understand a core amount of why the drug war started and why it continues. In 1939, in a hotel in Midtown Manhattan, the great jazz singer Billie Holiday walked onto a stage and she sang a song called Strange Fruit. I think most of you will know this song, but it's a song about lynching. It's the idea that in the South, there's a strange fruit that hangs from the trees and it's the bodies of black men who've been murdered, murdered by racists. Billie sang this song to a mixed audience. They didn't actually let her walk through the front door of the hotel because she was black, they made her go through the service elevator, but she sang it to a mixed audience. And you've got to understand, as her goddaughter Lorraine Feather said to me later, you've got to understand how incredibly incendiary this, this was seen as at that time. There were no political pop songs. There almost never had been. You know, the most popular song in the country at the time was called P.S. I Love You. Some of you remember that. Very sweet anodyne love songs. And Billie Holiday stands there and she sings this song that years later was described as the musical starting gun for the civil rights movement. And that night, Billie got a warning from the agents of a man called Harry Anslinger, who ran the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. 
And these agents said, in effect, stop singing this song. And it might seem like a weird place to begin this story, right? Why is Billie Holiday being told not to sing a song, a story about the war on drugs? What happened next tells us so much. So Harry Anslinger was a government bureaucrat, a big, bald government bureaucrat who'd taken over the Department of Prohibition just as alcohol prohibition was ending. So he had this, you know, the government fought a war on alcohol and alcohol won. And he had this big government department that he wanted to keep going. And he invented to keep his department going the modern war on drugs. In fact, he's the first person to ever use the phrase war on drugs, decades before Nixon or Reagan or anyone else. And he built the war on drugs, not, he, not entirely cynically, he believed in it. And he built it around two groups he absolutely loathed. The first was black people. He was so racist that he was regarded as an extreme racist in the 1920s, which was kind of hard to do, right? He used the N-word so often in official memos, his own senator said he should have to resign. Um, absolutely intense racist. And, and he also hated Latinos, Chinese Americans, other people. Um, the second group he hated was people with addiction problems. When he was a little boy, he grew up on a farm in a place called Altoona in Pennsylvania. And when he grew up on this farm, uh, the next farm down, the farmer's wife had a morphine addiction. And she would scream a lot. And he was really haunted by these screams and he really hated and feared people with addiction problems. In fact, he said that they were, he believed that addiction was contagious person to person. He often compared people with addiction problems to typhoid Mary. And Billie Holiday was the symbol of everything he hated. She was a black woman standing up to white supremacy in an incredibly bold way. And she had an addiction problem, we know why. Billie Holiday grew up in Baltimore. Uh, in a suburb of Baltimore, uh, in a city part of Baltimore called Pigtown, which was at that time almost literally the poorest part of the United States. It was, um, it, it was the last part of the United States that didn't even have a sewage system. And when Billy was 10, one day a man came for her, 43 year old man named Wilbur Rich. And he said, oh, your mother sent me to come and get you, you gotta come with me. So she went with him and he violently raped her. Wilbur Rich was punished for what he did. He was sent to prison for a year. Billy was punished much more severely. They said, these were the words they used, that she was a whore, that she made him do it, that she brought it on, um, that, that she incited him. And she was sent to a, um, a convent where they, they would correct her, they would teach her what she'd done wrong. And even at that age, Billy Holiday was a really spirited person. She said, I didn't do anything wrong. And they escalated and only punished her in more and more extreme ways. They, um, they used to lock her in, for example, with the dead bodies overnight. It had a kind of funeral part as well um, to, to teach her a lesson. God knows what they thought they were teaching her. And after this went on for a while, Billy ran away and she went, ran to actually find her mother. Her mother was working in a brothel in Harlem. So Billy went there, she was with her mother for a while, and then she started working, I'm putting working in inverted commas, alongside her mother. So she was a child prostitute. She was being prostituted for money, raped by strangers for money, night after night after night. Uh, when she was 15, the brothel was raided. Police didn't rescue her, didn't take her to safety. Would you, I don't know who the, whose phone is pinging. If you could turn it off, it'd be great. So it just slightly throws me off. Um, the, um, uh, I did that, I, my own phone pinged during when I spoke the other day, so no judgment. Um, when they raided the brothel, um, they didn't rescue her. They took her to prison. She was imprisoned for two years on uh, what's now Roosevelt Island. Um, but at the same time as she's coping with this pain, Billie was also realizing she was one of the great geniuses of American history. Billie Holiday reinvented American singing. People as different as Frank Sinatra and Jay-Z said that she transformed how they did what they did later. She, she was an extraordinary musical genius. She began to sing. And when people, when she sang, people were enraptured by her singing. And she became a very successful singer. But when she got this warning, from Harry Anslinger. So when she got this warning from him to stop singing, she said, I'm glad Harriet came before me because it taught me it doesn't mind if you don't mind if I swear. She said, fuck you, I'm an American citizen. I'll do what I damn well please. And at that point, Harry Anslinger resolved to destroy her. Um, he, he, he absolutely resolved to crush her. And he couldn't really, he hated employing black agents, 
but you couldn't really um, send a white guy to follow Billy Holiday everywhere around Harlem. It'd be kind of obvious. So he employed an agent, a black agent called Jimmy Fletcher. And he said to Jimmy Fletcher, um, follow her everywhere she goes, document her drug use, drop, document the drug use of any jazz singer you come across. He believed that jazz music in these insanely racist terms was jungle music that would be used to hypnotize white people um, into falsely believing in interracial equality as he, as he put it. Um, so he said to Jimmy Fletcher, follow her everywhere. We're gonna have a pogrom of jazz musicians. So Jimmy Fletcher spent a year and a half following Billie Holiday everywhere. And Billie Holiday was so amazing, he fell in love with her. And his whole life, he felt really ashamed of what he did next. He arrested her. She was put on trial uh, for drug use. The, dr the trial was called the United States versus Billie Holiday. She said that's how it damn well felt. She was sentenced to 18 years in prison. Uh, she didn't sing a word in prison. But what happened next is even worse. When she got out, almost all places in the country where you could um, sing in front of an audience, where they sold alcohol, you needed something called a cabaret performer's license. Anslinger and his men make sure that Billy is denied that cabaret performer's license, that she doesn't get it. One of her godchildren said to me, what's the cruelest thing you can do to someone? It's to take away the thing they love. Imagine taking away singing from Billy Holiday. Um, this, by the way, is what we do to people with addiction problems all over the country today, right? Instead of helping them reconnect with the society, we give them criminal records that make it much harder for them to reconnect, much harder. Um, and in this situation, deprived of the thing she was a genius at, most of it. Oh, did uh, is that someone's phone come back to life? <laughs> That's right. It might be a ghost of someone trying to communicate. Um, the um, in that in that situation. Billy relapsed. Uh, she starts using very heavily again. She'd always been a heavy drinker. She started really heavily using heroin. And um, one day, a few blocks from where she sung Strange Fruit that day in Midtown Manhattan, she collapsed and she was taken to hospital. The first hospital would not let her in because she had an addiction problem. The second hospital agreed to take her, but Billy said on her way in there to her best friend, Maylee Dufty, that Anslinger's men weren't finished. She said, they're gonna kill me in there. Don't let them, they're gonna kill me. She wasn't wrong. On a in the hospital, they diagnosed her with very advanced liver cancer. Anslinger's men came in and arrested her on a hospital bed. She was handcuffed to the hospital bed. Um, she, they wouldn't let her friends in to see her. They wouldn't let her have a rocket, her, her record player. I interviewed the last surviving person to be in that room. A man I think of as the kind of spiritual father of your movement, a man named Reverend Eugene Callender. Um, Reverend Callender was a pastor in Harlem. And he got to know lots of jazz musicians who had addiction problems. And he saw that this way of treating them was barbaric and heinous. And he set up the first ever drug treatment center in, in Harlem. Uh, and they had to let him in because he was a religious minister. It was the one person they couldn't stop getting in. Um, and he prayed with her and they left. And he led a protest outside the hospital where they had signs saying, her, her stage name was Lady Day. They had signs saying, let Lady Day live. Big protest because they said they're killing her in there. Um, in the hospital, they didn't give Billy any heroin. She went into withdrawal, which is very dangerous when you're as weak with liver cancer as she was. But Maylee, her friend, managed to insist they give her methadone and she rallied. And then a few days later, Anslinger's men cut off the methadone and she died the next day. Anslinger wrote gloatingly, there'll be no more good morning midnight for her. Um, when she was buried in Harlem, uh, they had a huge number of riot police because people believed, in my view, rightly, that they had effectively killed her and they were concerned there would be a riot. And Reverend Callender said, she was only in her 40s, Reverend Callender said, she, we should have, in, a, in the eulogy, he said, we should have had her genius for another 40 years. This story tells us so much, I think. It tells us what the war on drugs was about from the start. If you'd asked me when I began doing this research, why are drugs banned? I would have thought, well, if we stop the next 20 people to walk past this building and we said to them, well, why are drugs illegal? Most of them would say, well, quite rightly, you don't want kids to use drugs. Um, these are proper goals. You don't want kids to use drugs. You don't want people to become addicted. Look back at the evidence of why drugs was banned. Look at the Senate debates. That's not why drugs were banned. That's not why they did it. They did it to violently repress black people. 
to violently repress Latinos and Chinese Americans and poor white people to give them an excuse to crack down and to violently uh, repress people with addiction problems. That was why they did it. Absolutely, clearly, explicitly, plainly stated that was why they did it. Um, that, of course, as we all know, is a dynamic that continues today, right? Um, black people are no more likely to use drugs in this country than any other ethnic group. They make up the majority of the people who are in prison for it. Um, in fact, in Washington, D.C., a third of all black men between the ages of 18 and 24 are in prison on probation or parole at any given time, right? At any given time. So it's even more, think about the level of criminalization that's happening there. Um, but, you know, for me, actually, this helped me in a much more personal way to understand this. You know, Billie Holiday there's only one heroic story we tell in our culture about people with addiction problems, which is that sometimes they stop using drugs and recover. And that is absolutely a heroic story. And I know there's lots of people in this room in that position, and you should be really proud of yourselves. But you know, Billy never stopped being addicted. She died on that hospital bed with a heroin addiction. She was still an unbelievable hero. She was still an unbelievable hero. You know, no matter what they did to her, she always found somewhere where she could go and sing Strange Fruit. She would go to the worst parts of the Deep South where they threw bottles at her, where they spat at her. She sang her song. She never let them stop her from singing her song. And in a way, I feel like this conflict between Billie, Billie Holiday and Harry Anslinger has not ended. Every day, all over the world, people listen to Billie Holiday and it makes them stronger, and it makes them better. And every day all over the world, with a handful of exceptions, I'm gonna to come to them, we follow the script laid down by Harry Anslinger. We shame and punish and harass people who in fact need help. And when I think about Billie Holiday's story, one of the things, I mean, it helped me because with the people I love to think, oh, actually, the, even in the throes of this addiction, you are capable of strength and heroism. When I think about Billie now, person I compare her to in my mind, in addition to like artistic geniuses like Picasso, the person I always think of is, you remember the guy uh, in Tiananmen Square in China when the democratic protesters occupied Tiananmen Square in 1990 and the Chinese communist tyranny go to clear them out. And there's a man, we still don't know his name, who stands in front of one of the tanks, just in absolute anger and defiance at this injustice and the tank rolls him over. That was Billie Holiday, right? A person who stands in the face of anger and injustice and says, no, this is not right. And Billie was very explicit about that. She knew there were other places in the world, like Switzerland, that had more compassionate drug policies. At her trial, she said, all I want is someone to help me. And I remember when I read the transcripts of the trial thinking, how many times this story could have been different? How many times all that money that was spent to shame and punish and imprison her could have been spent differently? When she was 10 years old and she was raped by a 43 year old man and she could have been told that wasn't your fault that should never have happened when she was 15 and she was being prostituted in a brothel and the police find her again when they could have said we're so sorry this happened we should have protected you at every stage when all that money was spent humiliating and breaking her when it could have been spent giving her love and compassion and i you know i think a lot about a woman called yolanda bavan who's a, herself a great jazz singer who knew billy and loved her. And Billy called her her daughter. She was a very precocious young jazz singer. She was 17 when Billy died. She tried to get into the hospital, they wouldn't let her in. But when I saw Yolanda, um, she'd been telling me how towards the end of her life, Billy thought she'd be completely forgotten. No one would remember her. And Yolanda said to me, I said to her, what would you say to Billy Holiday if you could talk to her now? This was maybe eight years ago. And she said to me, I'd say to her, Billy, this morning, I went into Whole Foods and they were playing your songs. Nobody forgot you, baby. And we're never gonna forget Billie Holiday's musical genius. I think we should remember her political and moral genius. And I think we should try to be more like Billie and less like Harry Anslinger. Um, I wanna talk a bit about another thing that I learned, which I found really challenging actually. Um, and it's about the nature of addiction itself. And I think it challenges some of the stories that we are very dominant even among um, incredibly good and well-intentioned people like in this room and certainly in my mind like about the opioid crisis. So if you'd asked me 
when I started doing this research 10 years ago, what causes, let's say, heroin addiction, because that was close to me, I would have looked at you like you're an idiot. I would have said, well, the clues in the name, obviously heroin causes heroin addiction, right? We've been told this story for a hundred years that's become absolutely part of our common sense. It was certainly part of mine. So we think if we kidnap the next 20 people to walk past this hotel on their way to the airport, and every day for a month, we injected them three times a day with heroin, like a villain in a horror movie. At the end of that month, they'd all have a heroin addiction for simple reason. There's chemical hooks in heroin that if they're exposed to them enough, they'd start to desperately physically crave. And at the end of this month, they'd have this tremendous physical hunger for the drug. And that's what addiction is, right? They have a tremendous physical hunger for the chemical hooks inside the drug. That's why in the English language, another word for being addicted is being hooked, right? You have this tremendous physical desire for the chemical hooks. It turns out that's, that's not wrong, but chemical hooks are a really small part of what's going on. And the first thing that alerted me to the fact there's something not right about that story is when it was explained to me in Britain, where I'm from, as you can tell by my weird Downton Abbey accent, um, if, if any of you go to Britain and you step out into the street and you get hit by a truck um, and you break your hip, you'll be taken to hospital and you'll be given a lot of a drug called diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin, right? It's medically pure heroin. It's much better than the stuff you would score in the streets. It's, it's the good stuff, right? Uh, anyone here who has a, a British cousin, a British grandmother who's had a hip replacement operation, your grandma's taken a lot of heroin. If what we think about addiction is right, that it's caused primarily or entirely by, chem by exposure to the chemical hooks. What should be happening to all these people in British hospitals who are being given heroin for quite a long period of time? Some of them should be leaving addicted. They should be trying to score on the streets. This has been studied very carefully. It never happens. And I remember when I learned that, just thinking, well, that can't be true. It, it doesn't make any sense. How could you have a situation where you've got a person in a hospital bed being given a load of really pure heroin, they do not become addicted. And you've got someone shooting up in the alleyway outside, actually using a much weaker, shittier form of the drug, and they do become addicted. Why would, how could that be? And I only began to understand it when I went to Vancouver and interviewed an incredible man named Professor Bruce Alexander, who's really changed, he did an experiment that's trans led to a transformation in how we think about addiction. So Bruce, Professor Alexander explained to me, this story we have in our heads addiction is caused primarily or entirely by the chemical hooks comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century you can do them at next year's conference if you're feeling a little bit sadistic what you do is you take a rat you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles one is just water the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine don't do this at the conference and uh, if you do that the rat will try both they don't know what's in them and um and they always, almost always prefer the drugged water, and they almost always kill themselves by overdosing within a couple of weeks. So there you go, that's our story. The rat is exposed to the drug, it wants more and more once it's got the hooks, until eventually it dies by overdosing. Makes perfect sense. But in the 70s, Professor Alexander came along and said, well, hang on a minute, you put the rat alone in an empty cage, it's got nothing that makes life worth living for rats. What would happen if we did this differently? So he built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically heaven for rats. They've got loads of friends, they've got loads of cheese, they've got loads of colored balls, they can have loads of sex. Anything a rat can want in life, anything it finds meaningful is there in Rat Park. And they've got both the water bottles, the normal water and the drug water. And of course they try both. This is the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drug water. They hardly ever use it. None of them use it compulsively. None of them overdose. So you go from almost 100% compulsive use and overdose when they do not have the things that make life worth living, where their psychological needs are not met, to no compulsive use and overdose, where they do have the things that make life worth living. Now, there's lots of human examples. I'm going to come to them. Lots of evidence this is true of humans. But I realized, I remember one time going to see Bruce and leaving, and thinking, oh, so the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. Hugely valuable, though, that is to many people. The opposite of addiction is connection. The, the core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life, 
because your life is too painful a place to be. And once you understand that, you can see why what we do with the drug war, what we did to Billy, what we do all over the country today, is such a disaster. The theory of the drug war, Harry Anslinger's theory, is if someone's got an addiction problem, you need to inflict pain on them to make them stop. But once you understand that pain is the cause of addiction, pain is the driver of addiction, you can see sometimes we say, oh, what well, war on drugs doesn't work when it comes to addiction. That's true, but it hugely understates the problem. It's not that it doesn't work. It makes the problem worse. It makes the problem drastically worse. Um, we've just lived through a really interesting human example of this. Since the global pandemic began, going into the pandemic, we had the highest level of overdose deaths in the history of the country. And during COVID, they massively increased. And I think if you go back maybe 10 years, if I'd said to all of you, you know, 10 years from now, eight years from now, there's going to be a, a global pandemic, right? It's going to be a respiratory disease. It's going to spread person to person. It's going to kill lots of people by suppressing their breathing. I don't think it would have been obvious to us that that would cause an, an increase in addiction and overdose rates, right? But when you understand Rat Park, it makes perfect sense. All our lives became drastically more like those first cages that guaranteed addiction and much less like Rat Park right? Everywhere where connection is reduced, addiction goes up. Or think about the opioid crisis. I think we've been telling a dangerously simplistic story about the opioid crisis. Um, the story we've been telling is basically a kind of liberal equivalent of the Nancy Reagan story about crack. So Nancy Reagan told this story. You'll all remember it. Um, it's funny, I can never think about Nancy Reagan without thinking about something she said when, when they were running to be governor of California. She was asked once, apparently, this is not ironic, she meant it seriously. She was asked, what do you think of red China? And she said, never with a white tablecloth. Um, but, <laughs> but um, so that's not my point that I'm making though. Uh, the, um, Nancy Reagan told the story about the crack epidemic that was essentially, this uniquely powerful drug has been created. These uniquely evil drug dealers are selling it. And that's why we've got an addiction problem. We now know that was a ludicrously simplistic way of talking about the crack, the so-called crack epidemic. But we're telling effectively the same story now, except this time the uniquely powerful drug is OxyContin and the uniquely evil drug dealers are the Sackler family. And don't misunderstand me, Sackler family are wicked people and I hope they die in prison and I hope they lose all their money. But I have to be honest with you, it's really oversimplified to think they're the this is the main cause of the opioid crisis. There's certainly things they did appallingly wrong. They mismarketed the drugs. They lied about their potency. It was appalling. But where is the opioid crisis biggest? You know, every single person on the Harvard faculty tomorrow could go and get opioids because they from their doctor because they've got really good health insurance and their doctors trust them. Addiction is very low on the Harvard faculty. Every, compare that to West Virginia, where, you know, almost half the population don't have medical insurance and their doctors do not trust them. And yet that's one of the epicenters of the opioid crisis. Opioid addiction is not predicted by, by purely by opioid access. It's actually a very poor predictor. Where is the opioid crisis highest? It's in the places where people are in most despair where they have been deprived of the things that make life worth living. You know, Professor Anne Case and Professor Angus Dayton, um, who did the best research on this, called the opioid deaths, deaths of despair. Opioid deaths are highest where suicide not by opioids is highest, where antidepressant use is highest, where all the indicators of despair are highest, right? Um, so we have to understand opioid addiction is an like all addiction is an attempt to solve underlying despair. And if you increase people's despair and humiliation, you will increase their desire to anesthetize themselves from it. We've got to deal, of course you should deal with some of the opioid prescription issues, but we've got to deal with the underlying despair, with the underlying pain. Professor Alexander, who did the Rat Park experiment, says we talk all the time in addiction about individual recovery, and that is absolutely right and proper, but we need to talk much more about social recovery. Something hasn't just gone wrong with us as an individual. Something has gone wrong with us as groups. You know, um, everyone here knows they have natural physical needs, right? Obviously, you need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air. If I took those things away from you, you'd be in real trouble real fast. But there's equally strong evidence that all human beings have natural psychological needs. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel that people see you 
and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. And our culture is good at many things. I'm glad to be alive today. But we have been getting less and less good at meeting people's deep underlying psychological needs for a very long time. Before the pandemic began, you know, there's a study that asks Americans, how many close friends do you have who you could turn to in a crisis? And when they started doing it years ago, the most common answer was five. Today, the most common answer is none. What is life like when you have nobody to turn to to share your joy and pain? 42% of Americans before the pandemic agreed with the statement, no one knows me well. What is life like? We're a social species. We evolved to live in tribes. What is life like? That's not an irrational misfiring when you feel terrible, when you're isolated and alone. That's the proper response. It's a signal saying we need to rebuild a tribe. We need to rebuild a group. Um, and I can talk about all sorts of ways we can do that in the Q&A. Please ask me. I've got some ideas and places I've reported on that have done this successfully. But I think you can tell what we do to people with addiction problems is, is um, very close to my heart. Actually, my research I learned it is not the most damaging element of the war on drugs. Although it's horrendous. The most damaging element is something else. It's the violence created by prohibition. And I just wanted to explain that. Just say, imagine any of you tonight go to the local liquor store and try to steal a bottle of vodka. So just pick up a bottle of vodka and walk out the store with it. That store uh, will call the cops and the cops will come and arrest you. So the people who work in that store, they don't need to be violent. They don't need to be intimidating. They don't need to fight you. They've got the power of the law to uphold their property rights. Okay, now imagine you go to wherever it is in Minneapolis where you go to, to get a bag of cocaine or a bag of heroin and you try to steal that from the guy who sells it. And he catches you, obviously he can't call the cops. The cops would come and arrest him. He has to fight you, but he doesn't wanna be having a fight every day. So he's got to establish a reputation through violence for being so frightening that you wouldn't be so dumb as to fuck with him, right? So the, the, the war on drugs, he, in fact, that dealer establishes his place in that neighborhood through violence and intimidation. The way Charles Bowden, an American journalist, put it, is the war on drugs creates a war for drugs. And, and if you want to know how much of that is due to prohibition, ask yourself, does the head of cause go and shoot the head of Smirnoff in the face? Does your local bar send teenagers to go and shoot up the next bar down? No, that never happens. Exactly that happened under alcohol prohibition. We all know who Al Capone was. I bet none of you know the name of the head of Smirnoff, right? When did that violence from alcohol prohibition end? It ended the day alcohol was legalized again. Literally that day, there's a guy at Harvard called Professor Jeffrey Myram that a graph of violence in the 20th century in the United States massively shoots up when alcohol is prohibited and drops like a stone when alcohol is legalized again and rises massively when drug prohibition is intensified in the late 60s and early 70s, right? It's not the only cause. It's why Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, calculated that this dynamic, the war for drugs, kills 10,000 Americans every year. It's far more than that now. Um, you know, um, this is why... Uh, slightly weirdly, I've become friends with Pablo Escobar's son, who's actually super nice. Uh, he used to be called Pablo Escobar Jr., but for obvious reasons, he changed his name. Uh, but uh, he said to me, the only thing my father feared was the legalization of drugs. The only thing. He said, if drugs had been legal, my dad would have been a used car salesman and you would have never heard his name. And I think it's really important to understand the cost this violence imposes. It's a huge cost here in the United States. It's a huge cost cost here in Minneapolis specifically, but many other cities and everywhere in the country. Um, but it has the most catastrophic effect on supply route countries. And to explain that, I just want to tell you one story. A woman, uh, well, you'll see what connection I ended up having with her. So in 2006, in Ciudad Juarez, just the other side of the American border in Mexico, the other side from El Paso, there was a nurse called Maricela Escobedo. And Maricela was a, a, a nurse, but she was unbelievably hardworking. So on weekends, she would also, she would carve wooden things that she made and she sold them in the market in Juarez. There was a big market, street market at the time. And she would go there and she would take her 14 year old daughter, Ruby, and they would sell. And one day a guy called Sergio, who was in his early twenties, was kind of hanging around. And he asked Mar he said his girlfriend was about to have a baby. Could, 
could Maricela give him a job? And Maricela was a pretty soft-hearted person, so she gave Sergio a job and got to know him. And about two months later, she caught him uh, having sex with her daughter, who was 14, and she was horrified and obviously fired him. And uh, she went to the police, but the police didn't do anything. She was kind of puzzled why that was. Um, anyway, her daughter, Ruby, kept running away to see Sergio. And Maricela kept going back to the police saying, this guy is, he's, I think he was 23, he's having sex with a 14 year old, you've got to go and arrest him. Police wouldn't do anything. She was completely baffled. And then when Ruby was 15, she got pregnant by Sergio. And Maricela kept trying to keep her in the house, but Ruby kept running away to live with Sergio. And in the end, Maricela was just like going to visit her, trying to keep as much contact as possible. The baby was born. And one day, just before Christmas, Maricela, she would go almost every day. She turned up and Sergio was holding the baby. And Maricela said, where's Ruby? And he said, oh, she's left. She, she's run away with another man. And Maricela said, what do you mean? She said, oh, she's run away with another man. She said, what, and, and left her baby? No, she hasn't done that. My daughter would not do that. He said, yeah, she's gone. So Maricela took the baby. She kept going back. To, to look for Sergio, to look in the house. She couldn't find Ruby. A few days pass and she goes to the neighborhood and she starts to hand out leaflets with pictures of Ruby on them saying, have you seen my daughter? Have you seen my daughter? And um, about a week later, she got a call from a teenage boy called Anne Hal. He said, I know something, but I'm really scared. I'll only tell you if you come and drive out into the desert with me. So Maricela went, she drove out into the desert with Anne Hal. He said, look, I'm risking my life here, but I have to tell you, Sergio murdered your daughter, Ruby, and he made me and some other teenage boys dispose of the body. And he told her where it was. It was a, an area behind an abattoir where they put pig, pig bones. So Maricela went, she dug through all these pig bones and she found the remains of Ruby. She went to the police. The police did finally act. Uh, Sergio was put on trial. It was about nine months later. And at the trial, Sergio broke down crying, admitted what he'd done and apologized to Maricela. And then a week later, he was mysteriously acquitted on all counts and disappeared. And Maricel just cannot make sense of this. She's like, what's going on? Why did the police do nothing? Why has he been acquitted? That was when she was discovered. So drug supply routes move around the whole time, right? And at that time, they were, because depending on where the government cracks down, so it might go through uh, the Caribbean, through the Caribbean into Florida, into Miami. Remember Miami Vice, one of the greatest TV shows ever. Then the government cracks down. And it moves, it started to move back through Juarez, through Mexico. And picture a housing project here in, here in Minneapolis. If 10% of the economy of that housing project is in the hands of armed criminal gangs selling drugs, it's going to be a pretty miserable place to live. At that time in Juarez, 70%, 70% of the economy was that movement of illegal drugs through up from Central America into, into from Colombia mostly into into the United States, at which point, if it's 70%, the criminal gangs um, have more money than the state, right? So they bought the police. The, the main criminal gang at the time was Los Zetas, um, and they basically bought the police. The police worked for them. And it turned out Sergio was a member, was a Zeta, and suddenly Maricela, it's explained to Maricela, that explained why the police never did anything when they found out that Ruby, that he was having sex with a child because the police work for them. And it was why the judge had let him escape. And it was why now no one would do anything. But Maricela refused to accept that she lived in a place with no justice. So she called, this was happening to lots of women. If you remember the Zetas, you could murder a woman, rape women, murder women with impunity because you owned the government, right? Um, so Maricela called for every mother who had a child who'd been raped or disappeared to come and join her. She said, we're gonna find Sergio. We're gonna at least find one of these killers. And for two years, Maricela and a band of mothers whose daughters had disappeared, followed, every, they turned themselves into private detectives and they went everywhere in Mexico they could possibly go, following leads about where Sergio was. And everywhere they went, they walked and the media would follow it. And it became this huge event. They would walk through the desert um, and they would, track down gangsters. I remember saying to Anna, who is one of the women who went with Maricela, weren't you scared? She said, of course, we were terrified. But sometimes your love for your children is greater than your fear. After two years, Maricela found Sergio. 
she followed every lead and she tracked him down to a, a town in the, in, the, in the south. And she went to the police and she explained it. She said, go and get him. And the police tipped him off and he disappeared again. So at that point, Maricela went to the state governor's mansion in Chihuahua with all these women and they built a camp at the entrance to the governor's mansion, these grieving mothers or mothers who didn't even know whether to grieve because they didn't know where their daughters were. And they said, we're not leaving here until you arrest Sergio and you announce a commission to find our daughters. And Maricela said, that's it, I'm staying. And the next day she gave an incredible speech calling for every mother in Mexico to come and join her. And as she was giving the speech, a man walked up to her and shot her in the head. Um, when we think about the victims of the war on drugs, we should be thinking about Maricela and the untold tens of thousands of people like her who live on the supply route countries who are being systematically murdered. And she would not be alive, she would not be dead now, she would be having a good life and Ruby would be having a good life if we had not handed one of the biggest industries in the world to vicious depraved criminal gangs. And like Pablo Escobar's son told me, we can reclaim those industries from those armed criminal gangs. So I just want to finish by talking to you about two places that I regard as the solution, or at least the beginnings of the solution, two countries that decided to adopt a different route. And it's worth saying the war on drugs is an attempted solution, right? So let's think about how well that solution is working. The United States has fought the drug war for 100 years. We've spent a trillion dollars. Uh, we've imprisoned millions of American citizens, more than any country as a proportion has ever imprisoned its citizenry. Uh, we've destroyed whole neighboring countries. And at the end of all that, we can't even keep drugs out of our prisons where we pay someone to walk around the wall the whole time. Gives you a sense of how well that's ever gonna work, right? So what I wanted to understand, has anywhere done it better? So I'm talking to you about two places I spent a lot of time in which have done it better. So. Portugal in the year 2000 had one of the worst drug problems in the world. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is staggering. And every year they tried the American way more. They arrested more people, they imprisoned more people, they shamed more people. And every year the problem got worse. Until finally, the prime minister and the leader of the opposition and the leaders of the main other parties got together and decided to do something incredibly radical, something nobody had done in the 70 years since Harry Anslinger started the drug war. They said, shall we like ask some scientists what to do? So they set up a panel of scientists and doctors led by an amazing man I got to know named Dr. Joao Gulao. And they said to them, so it was a panel of scientists, doctors, a social work, a few social workers and a judge. And they said to them, you guys go away, figure out what would genuinely solve this problem. And we've agreed in advance we'll do whatever you recommend. So the goal was to just take it out of politics, uh, an inconceivable idea in the United States at the moment, I know, but that was the goal. So the panel went away and they looked at all the evidence, including Rat Park, and they came back and they said, okay, everyone, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna decriminalize all drugs from cannabis to crack, the whole lot. But, and this is the crucial next step, we're gonna take all the money we currently spend on screwing people's lives up on shaming them, imprisoning them, arresting them. All that money, we're gonna spend it instead on turning their lives around. And interestingly, it's not really what we think of as drug treatment in the United States. They do some residential rehab that has real value. Biggest thing they did was a huge program of reconnection for people with addiction problems. Say you used to be a mechanic. They'll go to a garage and they'll say, if you employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. They set up put loads of money into housing. They set up a big program of micro loans for people with addiction problems with help so they could set up and run small businesses about things they cared about. The goal was to say to every person with an addiction problem in Portugal, we love you, we value you, we're on your side, we want you back. And by the time I went to Portugal, the results were in. It was 13 years since this program had begun and the British Journal of Criminology uh, had done a major scientific review of all the evidence. Um, addiction fell by more than 50%. Overdose deaths fell by 80%. HIV transmission fell by 90%. Street crime also massively fell. It turned out uh, 
you know, one of the reasons you know it works so well is I went to interview a man called Joao Figuera, who was the top drug cop in Portugal at the time of the decriminalization. And he said what lots of people entirely understandably say when they hear the idea of decriminalizing all drugs. He said, this is crazy. We're going to have an explosion in drug use. We're going to have an explosion in children using drugs. We cannot do this. And Joao said to me, everything the other side said would happen did happen. And everything we said would happen didn't. And he said he felt really ashamed that he'd spent so many years prior to the decriminalization screwing people up further when he realized now he could have been helping them turn their lives around. I want to talk about another place that adopted a different radical strategy. It's worth explaining that the difference between decriminalization and legalization. So decriminalization is where you stop punishing users and people with addiction problems, but they still have to go to armed criminals to get their drugs. Legalization is where you open some legal route for them to get their drugs, right? And the advantage, decriminalization has many good things about it, but the advantage of legalization is it also deals with the war for drugs, the violence caused by prohibition, which is not dealt with by decriminalizing. In the year 2000, just like in Portugal, Switzerland had an enormous crisis. My dad's from Switzerland, and just so you know, Switzerland is a really conservative country. My Swiss relatives make uh, Donald Trump look like AOC. And when they saw this, they're really right wing. And when they saw this, this addiction, you know, no country likes seeing chaos, but Swiss people are obsessed with order, right? It's no coincidence they invented clocks. And they, when they're seeing you know, chaotic scenes of addiction in their parks, in their public places, they were horrified. So they have a really aggressive crackdown and they crack down and crack down and every year the problem gets worse. And then Switzerland got its first ever female president. Um, you guys might want to try that one day. Uh, a completely, <laughs> completely amazing person named Ruth Dreyfus, uh, one of my heroes. And Ruth said to them, explain to Swiss people, okay, we tried the drug war, I think I've got the solution. I think the solution is to legalize heroin for people with addiction problems. She said, I know you're going to think I'm completely mad. She said, when you hear the word legalization, what you picture is anarchy and chaos. She said, what we have now is anarchy and chaos. We have unknown criminals selling unknown chemicals to unknown drug users, all in the dark, all filled with violence, disease, and chaos. Legalization, she said, is how we are going to restore order to this chaos. So the way it works, it's important to say legalization means different things for different drugs. In the same way, I don't know the rules here in Minnesota, but um, I'm pretty sure anyone here, if you really wanted to, could own a dog, a monkey, and a lion, but I'm pretty sure the rules are different. Like a dog, you could just go into a store, a monkey, you probably need a license, and a lion, I'm sure they come and like inspect your house to make sure you're not a crazy person. So they're all legal, but they're legal in different ways. In the same way, no one is proposing legalizing heroin like like we've legalized cannabis in a lot of the United States. No one thinks there should be a heroin aisle in CVS or Walmart. That's not the, it's not the goal. The way it works is if you've got a heroin addiction in Switzerland, go to your doctor and you're given a menu of options. One of the options is 12, 12, 12 steps treatment. About half of people choose that. There are other things on the menu, methadone, buprenorphine, and one of them is to be assigned to the heroin clinics. I went to the heroin clinic in Geneva, spent a fair bit of time there for research. I think it tells you something that Ruth, the former president, lives directly opposite this clinic. So the way it works is you go to the clinic, you have to go at 7 a.m. because Swiss people believe in doing things insanely early. This is a constant fight between me and my dad. Um, you show up, you go in, and they give you medically pure heroin for free. You can't take it out with you, partly because they don't want you to sell it on the streets, but mainly because they want you to monitor you. You use it, and then you leave and you go to your job because you're given a huge amount of support to get housing, therapy, and employment. Um, and at first I found this really challenging, this clinic in Geneva, right? So you go, you're watching people use their heroin and then leaving. And I'm talking to these, these people. And so Dr. Rita Mange, who's the psychiatrist runs the clinic, is explaining to me, they will give you any dose you want, except for one that would kill you. And there's never any pressure to cut back. You can stay on it as long as you want. But as I'm speaking to people, I've discovered there's only three people on that program when I was there eight years ago, nine years ago, um, who were still on the program from when it had begun 12 years before, right? And I said to Dr. Mangi and to the people there, I don't understand this. It doesn't make any sense to me. 
you're giving people who are addicted to heroin a free infinite supply of heroin. Why, why, why do people stop? And Dr. Mangi said to me, well, we help them. And as their lives get better, they don't want to be anesthetized so much, which is kind of obvious once it's been explained to you, but seems so challenging to me at the time. Um, does anyone want to guess how many people have died of heroin overdoses in Switzerland since Switzerland legalized heroin? And want to shout out a number? Nobody, not a single person. More people have died in this state since I started talking to you of heroin overdoses than have died in all these years in Switzerland since this began. Um, and Swiss people, this was, as you can imagine, this was very controversial. Ruth spent a lot of political capital on this. And two years after the legalization, they had a referendum on whether to maintain it. Swiss people have referendums all the time. It's very easy to trigger it with a small number of signatures. They had a referendum and 70% of Swiss people voted to keep heroin legal. Not because they're so compassionate, they're really not. It's because crime went down so much and it saved so much money, right? The scenes of chaos in the streets went away. Um, just before Ruth stopped being president, she went to visit that clinic. Um, and a guy came up to her, one of the patients, and he handed her a note and ran off. And she put it in her pocket. And later she went back to the, the Swiss equivalent of the White House. And she remembered this moment. And she took this note out. She's sitting at her desk, the president's desk. And she read the letter. And the letter said, Dear President Dreyfus, I was homeless and I nearly died. I thought I was going to die. And this clinic opened and my whole life turned around. And then he said, I probably shouldn't tell you this. But if you go out your office door and go two doors down, you'll see me because I actually work for you now in the president's office. Everywhere I went where they moved beyond the war on drugs, from Switzerland to Portugal to Uruguay to Canada, the same pattern followed. It's really controversial at first. And a lot of people think you're crazy. And then they see the results. And it's not perfect. It's not a magic bullet. They still have problems in Portugal and Switzerland and everywhere else I went. But the problems reduce so much. You know, Switzerland has a very, uh, Portugal and Switzerland have very competitive political systems. Portugal has five main political parties. None of them want to recriminalize drugs, right? Not even the really right wing ones. It tells you something. When people see the alternatives in practice, they see how wrong Harry Anslinger was. So I think we need to think about these people. We need to think about Billie Holiday. We need to think about Bruce Alexander who did the Rat Park experiment. We need to think about Maricela Escobedo. We need to think about all the people in Portugal and Switzerland who fought for the right thing. And we need to listen to them. For a hundred years now, we've been singing war songs about people with addiction problems. I think we should have been singing love songs to them all along. Thank you. Thanks, cheers. Okay. Sorry, thank you. I'm um, sorry, thank you. Thanks. I'm, I, sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm too British to acknowledge applause in any way. It's funny, if you ever see any clips of the Queen, whenever they like applaud her, she, the, the late Queen, sadly, she, she always does this um, completely blank facial expression and then just goes, yes. <laughs> That's what you're trained as a British person to do, but thank you. Should we take some uh, questions? I think um, there's several microphones here. I've always had a secret longing to go into an audience with a microphone like Ricky Lake, but um, I'm going to resist the temptation. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much thank for you. sharing. Um, I get a little bit cynical about the United States and their for-profit prison system. Um, and then also wanting to keep certain classes in certain places in society. Um, I wonder if you could comment on that because I think we're pretty unique as a country with the for-profit prison system. Um, people are getting rich off the failure of humanity. And is that you, that's unique to America as far as I know. And I'm wondering how, how you would address that? Yeah, it's a really important question. Um, so I would give a slight, obviously, I think private prisons are absolutely disgusting abomination. But um, I would give reason to be a little bit more optimistic in that sometimes people say, understandably, uh, 
we're not going to be able to overturn the drug war because look at all these groups who make huge amounts of money out of the drug war. And they're absolutely right. If you want to know who makes money out of the drug war, just look at who funds the no campaign whenever there's a referendum to legalize cannabis, right? And it's private prisons, prison guard unions, police unions, uh, who are appalling in every circumstance, it seems, um, the uh, alcohol companies, and, and Mormons. And I would exempt the Mormons because that's an ideological thing, not a I mean, I still think they're wrong, but that's put the Mormons off to one side for a second, the others, and they're not all Mormons by any means, obviously, um, but the Mormon church. Um, so yeah, those groups are clearly making money out of this. But I don't think the reason why the drug war continues is because of that. It's a factor, but the reason the drug war continues, I think is pretty simple. Every politician is constantly in a democracy is constantly making a calculation. If I do this thing, how much praise will I get and how much shit will I get? And when the praise outweighs the shit, they'll generally do it, right? If it's a functioning democracy and we're not quite there, but money does distort it, but generally. So I think a lot about, you know, what's happened with gay people, right? I'm gay. Um, I didn't even hear the concept of gay marriage until I was 20. As recently as 2004, George W. Bush was using gay marriage as a wedge against Democrats, right? Because it was so unpopular. Now, this, this time for the Senate elections the, and the congressional elections, um, the Democrats are using gay marriage as a wedge against Republicans because gay marriage is so popular. Opinion changes, right? Opinion changes all the time. So what we need to do, if public opinion changes, that will overwhelm the real but not decisive role of money backing the drug war. So I think our job is to, and public opinion has changed staggeringly. We were, to, me and Al were talking earlier about um, you know, the day George W. Bush became president, 15% of Americans supported legalizing cannabis. The day President Biden uh, went into the White House, 70% of Americans supported legalizing cannabis, including a majority of both parties below the age of 50 and independents. That's a staggering change in a very short period of time, right? We can, and the one good thing about the drug war is it's been such a disaster that it's very hard, often I'm asked to go on TV and they'll say, well, who can we have against you to defend the drug war? Because they can't find anyone, right? <laughs> the only people who will defend it are people who are pe whose job is to go on the TV and defend it, right? So we've got to, it's also about explaining to people, you know, so 85% of Americans agree in polling that the war on drugs has failed, right? I'm always curious about the other 15%, I meet them every now and then, but the, the but, um, and they're overwhelmingly nice people who have good intentions. Um, I think the key thing is that also people are afraid of the alternatives, right? So a lot of people say, well, what we're doing isn't working, but surely if we decriminalize, that would mean selling drugs to children or whatever, right? So part of our job is to explain what decriminalization and legalization actually mean in practice and how they're not the things people fear and why they're positive. So I think it's a combination of things, but absolutely, I think we can shift opinion on this. And the thing is, we're gonna win this, but the question is when, and every person who joins the fight brings the day we win sooner. And the, the earlier that day comes, the more lives we save. Thanks, great. Hello, there's a woman here. Hello. I'm very jealous of your glasses. I sat on mine last night and uh, consequently squinting a little bit. I have a, a question about the treatment industry and what your perception is on this, because I just feel like treatment industry is complicit in not wanting people to get well. And in those countries like Switzerland and Portugal, how did that change? And I don't know how they do treatment in those countries anyway, but like, where do you see that shift happening um, as we start to change the way we look at addiction and what is your perception from the people that are in the industry as you travel across the country? Yeah, I think this is such an important question and I'm really grateful to you for raising it. So in the United States, this is this will sound like hyperbole or a joke, it is a literal truth. Dog kennels are more tightly regulated than addiction treatment. That is scandalous. And the good people who work in addiction treatment, and there are many, should be the people clamoring most for regulation. So I think it's an incredibly mixed bag. You are absolutely right. There are some obscene addiction treatment uh, centers that make people worse. And there are some absolutely fantastic addiction treatment centers that save people's lives. And it's a completely mixed bag. 
So my view is kind of several fold, um, and I think it's backed by the best evidence. Um, so for something as complex as human addiction, there has to be an extremely broad menu of options. 12 steps should always be on that menu, and it should never be the only thing on the menu, right? It's absolutely right and life-saving for some people and actually harmful for some other people. And we have to be mature enough to say that, right? And I think people become mature. I mean, I recently had a, um, a sinus infection, right? And they gave me one medicine, it didn't work. They gave me another one and it worked. If you told me you had a sinus infection now, I wouldn't go, you have got to use Demista. And if you said, no, you know what? I'd actually rather use this. I think you're going to die. How dare you? If I, you would think I was crazy, right? For complex problems, we need a range of options. And to demand everyone follows one option is unhealthy. Um, although I understand why people do it and they're, they're often acting with the best interests and out of genuine love and compassion. So, I mean, and then I can pull back and say, in the kind of bigger so if you're going to have a the treatment system we have it needs to be much more diverse it needs to be much more tightly regulated um but then i would pull back and say we put way too much weight on residential rehab as the solution right truth is if you and residential rehab absolutely saves some people's lives it is a good thing when it's done well but if you go in and then just go back to your previous environment where you're criminalized beaten down traumatized you know lonely it's like taking you briefly out of the isolated cage, putting you into Rat Park and then dropping you back into the isolated cage at the end of it. In a broken society where people are profoundly lonely, humiliated, financially insecure, a brief break in a nice place is not, is not ultimately the solution. So much more needs to be done about social recovery, not just individual recovery. And then I would say as a last thing, and I know this will seem a little bit pie in the sky, but I think it is important to say, um, it seems insane to have a for-profit healthcare system at all. I mean, I come from a country where no one in my family ever paid anything for healthcare, where you pay through taxation and we provide together. I just think one of the reasons the system is so bad is that it's entirely for-profit and in private hands. Not entirely for-profit, there's some obviously not for-profits, but uh, it's just a mad healthcare system that's completely dysfunctional and devastating and you should have Medicare for all. But anyway, sorry. That's, <laughs> but you know, I know that's a, that's a big demand and a big fight and I'm not glib about how difficult it is to get there, but that, that will solve some of these problems. So my question is, what do you think of our healthcare system? <laughs> Barbara, you know, when I when I when I first came to the US when I was a teenager and I met someone who worked in a hospital billing uh, department, I literally said, what do you mean? Why would a hospital have a billing department? <laughs> I didn't understand it. Right. Like that's that's you know, there's plenty of bad things about Britain. I'm not like waving the flag for Britain opposed to the US It's you know, sorry about the whole tea business. But the uh, but on this respect, you know, you can learn from a rational country. Good trip, man. Um, first off, I just have to say I am. I am your biggest fan. I oh. think I've I've read your your all your books and Chasing the Scream has changed my life. The work that I do, I've read it. I don't even I've countless times. I've given out copies. I I just I love everything about what you do. And you should know you're changing the way the world looks at addiction. You as an author have done a tremendous amount. I've been in in this. I'm in recovery. I've lost my brother and my sister both the same year to drug overdoses. I've, I'm a suicide survivor. Um, and I currently have been working in, you know, the recovery field for 15, 14, 15 years. And I've seen just in the last five years after your, your material started coming out and really opening up eyes, things change. Everyone knows who you are. Some, you know, obviously push against the way that you do things. I am 100% in line with you and Gabor Mate and, and just everything about it. I just think it's just phenomenal. Um, yeah, thank you. My question is, in, in Chasing the Scream, you talk about United Nations and how Harry Anslinger and enforcing other countries to adopt our policies on the war on drugs. And when other countries tried to actually get out of enforcing things the way that we did um we actually 
attacks them and came against them to make sure they kept the same drug policies. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, but we've enforced our horrendous policy on the rest of the world. And so we've done all this harm worldwide. Have you seen in your time of study, other countries begin to pull out and begin to do things differently um, than the war on drugs? Oh, well, thank you so much for what you said, and I'm really sorry for the loss you've had, and you should be really proud of the work that, that, you're, that you're doing. Um, it's funny you mentioned Gabor Mate. Does everyone know who Gabor is? Um, so Gabor is a wonderful friend of mine, a doctor in Vancouver. I have this, don't, if you promise not to post this on the internet, I'll tell you something about Gabor, which is that, um, so I love Gabor, he's a great person, but he's so serious, and every time I go to see him, I say, I pro I say to myself, don't do it this time, Johan, don't do it. Every time I see him, I just start telling jokes to try to make my determination to make him smile just once. And he just, no matter what joke I tell him, he just looks this severe, sad facial expression. And last time I saw him, I started telling these incredibly obscene jokes. I, I saw Joan Rivers tell once. Um, and he was just like, life is a very serious business here. Man. So I was like, oh God. <laughs> so I'm telling you that partly to discipline myself because I'm seeing him soon. And I'm like, right, don't do it. I'm not gonna tell any jokes. Um, you're totally right. People who don't know, basically, drugs were legal everywhere in the world until the 1940s. And at the end of the Second World War, Harry Anslinger, using US power, forces other countries to do it. So, for example, Thailand. Um, Thailand had a long tradition of opi opium use, wasn't a problem, smoked opium. Uh, of course, you occasionally have people who become addicted, like people who became addicted to alcohol, but it wasn't a huge addiction crisis or anything. And uh, the US demands they criminalize it. And to the Thai, so Anslinger is sitting at the UN in Geneva with um, the Thai representative. And Harry Anslinger says something that's always stayed with me. The Thai representative said, well, this won't work. We don't, it hasn't worked in your country. We haven't got a problem. Why would we do this? And Harry Anslinger said, these were his exact words. I've made up my mind. Don't try to confuse me with the facts which I think should be like the slogan for the entire drug war, right? I've made up my mind, don't try to confuse me with the facts. Uh, you're absolutely right. Loads of places have begun to rebel. Uh, for example, Ruth, the Swiss president. So the US constructed the UN drug, drug treaties and the UN drug treaties are really strict. They say you can't, basically can't legalize anything. They have some leeway for medical stuff. Um, so when Ruth did the legalization, um, it, when Switzerland did the legalization, Barry McCaffrey, who was Bill Clinton's drug czar, awful person in many ways, uh, goes to Switzerland and he, he does a press conference with Ruth and he starts just berating Switzerland. And Ruth, she's so great, Ruth, she said, Mr. Mc General McCaffrey, how many Swiss people voted for you? <laughs> and he was like, and she said, how dare you come and lecture us? We are a democracy. We have dealt with our problem incredibly well. You are a democracy. You have dealt with your problems very badly. You can do what you want and you should be accountable to the American people, but don't you dare come to Switzerland and tell us what to do. And by the way, stop bullying the poor Dutch people that you're about to go and visit about cannabis, right? Amazing, love Ruth, She's a great person. Uh, that's a model of how, but of course it's made a huge difference that, um, that the US, it's collapsing within the US itself, right? The US, until very recently, was until the Colorado and Oregon results in 2016, um, 2016, 20, 2012, when was it? Yeah, 2012. Um, until then, the US was still bullying countries for allowing legal cannabis use. Obviously, the US can't do that now, right? It would be ridiculous if the US said to ne the Netherlands, don't allow legal cannabis when half the, half the citizens of the United States live in places where cannabis is legal. So the, the, the achievements of reformers here have profoundly disrupted the ability of American state power to impose this on other people. And other people are just saying, screw this, this, isn't, this is crazy, right? We're not doing it anymore. Canada, you know, Justin Trudeau, uh, President Mojica in Uruguay. What, it's that thing, you know, that great thing, there was a British um, campaigner for, women's, for women to get the vote uh, called Millicent Fawcett. And she was, oh, I mean, they did terrible, literally tortured her. Um, and she held this sign up, uh, one of her protests that says, um, courage calls to courage everywhere, which I really love. It's the idea if one person is brave, Maricela quoted it as well. If one person is brave, it inspires other people to be brave everywhere. And I think that's, that's what's happened, right? I love the fact that Millicent Fawcett has, there's a statue now directly outside parliament in Britain 
of Millicent Fawcett holding that sign. And she's directly next to Winston Churchill, who hated her and really opposed women's votes. And I love that for all of eternity, he's going to have her like holding that banner there. It makes me so, not that Ch I mean, Churchill did good things as well, obviously, but the, uh, yeah, so yeah, people are rebelling and it's going well. Yeah, great. Couple more. Great, I'll try to do more quickly. I'm not good at short answers, sorry, I'll, I'll do my best. Thank you very much. Um, so people know I'm in the prevention. And so i um, got a question about um, the, the clinic in, in Switzerland. Are there criteria for who they will provide for? Is it somebody that already has issues with their substance use? Or can just anybody go in and say, I want to try this? Oh, yeah, no, no, it's, it's a very good question. No, no you've got to have a long-standing and serious addiction problem okay so if if you're someone who's just walking in off the street there's in geneva there's a what's it called a place just up the street where you can go where they'll give you all sorts of help but no you don't you can't just walk in without a heroin problem and say give me heroin okay uh, no definitely not it, that's that's not because yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there's a lot of kids they cool yeah um, <laughs> but then my other question is about impairment yeah so how is say driving impaired dealt with um in say switzerland oh it's a very serious crime for which people are punished i mean no no one's advocating the legalization of driving while intoxicated okay. I mean, but alcohol is legal and it's not legal to drive while drunk and in the same way you know it, heroin has been legalized but you obviously couldn't drive when you're in fact a condition of going to that program is you hand in your driver's license okay, and you can't that, drive that's what i'm wondering but, but bear in mind switzerland i mean Switzerland has public transport. You don't. You don't need to drive. Whereas, <laughs> you know, to drive exactly. You don't. It's yeah. not like you're handing in your license here, where that would be the end of your life, right? It's Switzerland has unbelievably good public transport. Yeah. Okay. Think, yeah. Because yeah. I'm wondering because because in places where cannabis has been um, legalized for adult use, the instances of impairment under THC has have increased. And so I'm just, I, I want to make sure that, you know, it's still a case that <laughs> have using affects you, but it also affects people around you. Oh, and so it needs to be understood that way. And yeah, you're right. In America, you can like drive impaired like 42 times before anyone really cares. <laughs> so yeah. Thank no, you. but I think you're making a really good point, which is, I, 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 how would I put this? I'm not a libertarian. And I don't have a libertarian attitude towards drug use, right? Individual choices affect other people. My case is not a libertarian argument. I've got lots of friends who are libertarians, I like them, but I think it's a ridiculously oversimplified way of thinking about the world, right? This isn't an individual rights. I mean, I, in theory, you know, individual rights, do what you want to your own body, okay, fine. I, don't, I wouldn't spend ages mounting a philosophical argument against it, but this is not where I come from. Mine is, we make decisions in the interest of the community and in the interest of the community it is better for those individuals. And, and you've gone to a difficult point and I, I, I'm glad you raised this because this is a difficult point. And it's one of the things that took me hardest to be persuaded on. Um, how would I put it? It's much easier to argue for compassion for people with addiction problems than to argue for the rights of drug users who do not have addiction problems right? Actually, most people are won over on the argument about addiction, right? Even really quite right-wing people uh, have been won over on that argument. It's very rare now you hear the argument that aggressively punishing people with addiction problems. You do occasionally hear it, but it's unusual. Um, the, the stuff about use that's not addictive use is, is a harder argument, weirdly, because uh, obviously personal use is, addiction is where someone has been harmed and personal use is not, in most cases. So it's a difficult one. And I think some of it is, um, some of it is that it's intoxicated people are very annoying, <laughs> you know? And that's true of alcohol, it's true of cannabis, it's true of cocaine. People on cocaine are insufferable, absolutely insufferable. Um, I think it's partly that. I think it's partly uh, Puritanism. You know, H.L. Mencken said Puritanism is the fear that someone somewhere is enjoying themselves. And I think there's, um, I think there's an element of that. I think there's there's all sorts of reasons going on there. And some of them is there's real harm, right? Um, and we shouldn't shy away from that, the complexity of that debate. On balance overall, you have to weigh the harm of, you know, the unpleasant smell of cannabis, the annoyingness of people on cocaine against the harm of 
140,000 people died in Mexico in the last eight years in just that drug war related violence. Um, how many people died in, in Colombia? More than 200,000. You know, half the Supreme Court was killed by Pablo Escobar. Um, whole country was basically destroyed. So you've got to weigh, we've got to honestly weigh these competing things and be completely candid. There are drawbacks. There are, as with any complex change, there are drawbacks. And we, there are things we can do to mitigate them. We should. The good thing about a legal project product product is you can regulate it. So you talked about THC. You're absolutely right. We should be much more tightly capping the amount of THC. You can't go into a liquor store and buy methylated spirits that are 80% alcohol in most states, and you shouldn't be able to buy cannabis that's such a phenomenally high rate of THC. And again, the but we can legal we can we can regulate a legal product. Nothing we can do to regulate an illegal product. Pablo Escobar doesn't care, right? The Zetas don't care. Whereas legal businesses have something to lose if you... So I think the things that you're rightly pushing against are things that can to a large degree be, be dealt with. Not all of them. Some of them are just gonna be drawbacks. But, but I think on balance, the, the advantages are hugely outweigh the drawbacks. Thanks. Great, should we do... One last question. Okay, I'll try to do something. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I will say I, I am with you on not a fan of the drug war. <laughs> I'm a fan, I like some of the things they've done in Uruguay. I like your example of Switzerland. Um, Canada has some very good things going on. One of the things when we say legalization in America is we have a habit of not just legalization, but we have an obsession with commercialization. Mm. And if we look at tobacco, alcohol, opioids, healthcare, Etc. on and on, we tend to commercialize these products. And there's a profit motive. And we have massive companies that manufacture, advertise, and do marketing around these products that we do know can cause harm. My question to you is, where is the right balance? Where I like that you say with government regulation, but even with THC in many states that have legalized cannabis, you have the concentrates that are 80, 90 plus percent THC being legally sold. Um, and so where is the balance? Yeah, I think it's a really important question. Um, I think it's important in the debate about commercialization where I totally agree with you. I think it's worth starting by saying, at the moment, we have the most dystopian possible commercialization. The Zetas are not a not-for-profit. Pablo Escobar was not a charity worker. We have the most depraved and wicked form of commercialization at the moment, which is a commercial market controlled by armed, violent murderers. So it's not like we have the choice between do we commercialize or not commercialize? It's choice do we have dystopian... So there's effectively three options. Dystopian commercialization with murderers, one extreme. The other extreme is libertarian free for all commercialization, where I totally agree with you, that's a disaster. Uh, it's not as much of a disaster as Pablo Escobar, but it's bad. Um, and then in the middle, you've got a regulated market. So think about tobacco, you, you raised that really rightly. So it'd be horrific if we went to the commercialization of tobacco in the 1950s. Joe Camel, you know, cigarettes are good for you, you know, that that horrific, uh, insane form of commercialization. I feel very personal about this because my mother smokes 70 cigarettes a day. I recently discovered a photograph of me and my mother when I'm six months old, where she's breastfeeding me, smoking and resting the ashtray on my stomach. And when, when I discovered this photo, I thought, oh, she'll feel really guilty. I'll show it to her. She said, you were a difficult baby. I needed that cigarette. But um, so... Tobacco is a really good example. We don't want to go back to the dystopian, but equally now, I think we actually have a pretty good model with tobacco. Advertising is banned. You can't market to children. You can't market to anyone uh, in most states. Uh, you buy it, it's got pictures of like lung cancer all over it. It's saying you will die if you use this. Probably going a bit far, but the, um, so that's a good model. That's extremely tightly regulated commercial sale, right? Now, look, I'm a European, I'd have it sold by a state monopoly, but that's just, we're not gonna do that here. So um, the the so I think that the, you're, you're absolutely right. To what, so I would say even worst case scenario of legalization, which is libertarian commercialization is better than what we have now. 
but there's no reason we should accept those as the two options. We can absolutely have a tightly regulated market, but it comes back to the bigger picture. It's like when we're talking about treatment and you've got to think about it in relation to healthcare. The truth is to get to that, you've got to have a political system that isn't paid for by powerful vested interests. You know, like, and I know these are, I'm just saying, we've got to change quite a lot about the country here, but like, it's true. If we legalize, um, there'll be a big powerful vested interest that will start to pay lawmakers and, and it'll be somewhat more libertarian than we would like. And public opinion can restrain that to some degree, but what would really restrain it would be a, a political system that's not accountable to rich people who pay for campaigns. But yeah, so your, your concern is totally right. And I do believe we can deal with it in a practical way. I should just say as well, I think you have some copies of my book back there and I'm very happy to sign them if you want, but I, um, I had this, just the last thought, I had this really weird thing where the very first time I ever did a book signing, there were these people in the line and the second, literally the second person in the line said, will you write a message for someone? And I said, sure, what do you want me to say? And she said, will you write, dear Peter, it's over, I never loved you anyway. So if you want me to sign a book, I will, but I will not dump your boyfriend for you. And I just want to say as the last thing, I'm really grateful to Pastor Ed for inviting me. And most importantly, I'm really grateful to all of you because you are where this movement can be moved, right? This is a, in a society that is so atomized, you are some of the last pockets of people who are actually talking to other people face to face. That has unbelievable power, power of love, connection and persuasion. Um, on top of that, you have meaning that you can offer people in a country so stripped of meaning to be able to offer connection and meaning and love and solutions is so great. And also many of you are speaking to people who have yet to be persuaded, which to me is the most valuable thing. We can talk to people who agree with us all day long. It's what the culture does most of the time. We angrily tweet at the people we don't like and we congratulate ourselves on how great we are for agreeing with each other. That's not gonna get us anywhere, right? What we can do is, is talk to people who don't agree in a spirit of love. And the people who don't agree with us are good people, overwhelmingly good people with entirely legitimate concerns, right? So I, I really think what you're doing is, is not just important, but one of the key things that has to happen now. So I hope you're all really proud of the work you're doing. I'm really proud to know Pastor Ed and I'm really thrilled to meet all of you. I'm gonna stick around, come and say hello, but thank, thank you all so much for what you're doing. Hooray. <laughs>